document. You're kidding. Nope. <laughs> Get ready because today we're diving deep into a legal battle. Oh, I love a good legal battle. This one's a doozy straight from the Philippines where the stakes were high, the maneuvers were bold, and the outcome, well, let's just say left its mark on the Philippine legal system. I'm intrigued. Lay it on me. So get this. The whole thing revolves around electricity or to be exact, electric companies. Okay. Two of them actually. Right. Nico II and Nico the Third. Catchy names. I'm assuming they're both in Nueva Ecija. You got it. Both operating in the same area. Now, what makes this case so fascinating is how a simple sale blew up into this huge legal mess. What kind of mess are we talking about? Think corporate law, labor disputes. Oh, boy. All because someone didn't cross their T's and dot their I's, you know? It's a cautionary tale, really, about knowing the ins and outs of the legal system. Yeah, those legal systems, they can be tricky. No kidding. Okay, so rewind with me. All the way back to 1992, this is where it all begins. Nico the Third gets dissolved. Dissolved, like gone. Gone, gone, gone out of business. So what happens to all their stuff? Huh? Buildings, equipment, all that. Exactly. You can't just leave that stuff lying around. Right. Right. So in this case, the National Electrification Administration, NEA for short, they scooped up all those assets. The government swoops in. Makes sense. So where does Nico Tusiket come into the picture? Hold your horses. We're getting there. Fast forward to 2004. Nico Sather, they're looking to expand. And guess what? They get a franchise to operate in. You guessed it. Nico the Third's old territory. Talk about convenient timing. Right. So in 2006, they make it official. Let me guess. They bought the assets from the NEA. Bingo. 300 million pesos, a hefty price tag. That's a chunk of change. Yeah. Straight purchaser. Ah, there's the catch deed of conditional sale. Think of it like a mortgage, but for power lines and transformers. Installment plan. Got it. So they get to use the assets, but don't fully own them yet. You're catching on. This is where things get juicy. Picture this. 2013, five years later, a group of former Nico the Third employees win this massive labor dispute case. How massive are we talking? 83 million pesos. That's what they were owed in back pay and benefits. Okay, so now the plot thickens. We've got unpaid employees and a company that thinks they've got it made. And the employees. They wanted their money. So they slapped a notice of levy and sale on Nico the Third's assets to get those 83 million pesos back. Problem is, ah. those assets. Yeah, Nico the Third, they thought those were as good as theirs. Oh boy, here we go. I bet they weren't too happy about that. You them. can say that again. Nico the Second cried foul. They said they were innocent purchasers, bought those assets fair and square. And that's where the legal battle really heats up. You bet. Nico the Second, they weren't backing down. They decided to fight fire with fire and filed something called a petition for declaratory relief. Okay, hold on. Declaratory relief. That's a new one. Break it down for me. Think of it like this. Imagine you're playing chess, right? Okay, I'm with you. And you're about to lose. The worst feeling. So, instead of admitting defeat, you ask your opponent to call it a draw. A sneaky move. That's essentially what Nico II was trying to do. They wanted the court to just declare that the assets were theirs, hands off, case closed, end of story. They argued that this old labor dispute shouldn't affect their purchase. So they're trying to wash their hands of the whole thing, just erase the past. Exactly. And get this, they even claim that because those assets used to belong to the government, they should be considered public funds. Public funds. You know, untouchable, off limits, can't touch this. Clever. So they were building a legal fortress using that public funds argument as their shield. So it's a real standoff. Sounds like it. You've got the employees saying, hey, we're owed this money. Right. And Nico II's waving that purchase agreement like a shield saying, nope, all ours. Classic legal showdown. Uh -huh. So what happens next? Do they settle out of court? Not a chance. This one's headed straight for the courtroom. First stop, the regional trial court, the RTC. Okay, so the local court. What do they think about all this public funds business? Well, get this. The RTC actually sided with Nico to second. Really? No way. You bet. They bought the public funds argument hook, line, and sinker. Hold on. So that's it. Case closed. Nico 2 wins. Not so fast. This is just round one, my friend. Remember the former employees led by Wilfredo Palma? Right. The ones who owed all that money. Exactly. Yeah. They weren't about to give up that easily. So what do they do? Appeal. Bingo. They took the case up the ladder, straight to the Court of Appeals, hoping for a different outcome. Gutsy move. I mean, going against a lower court's decision, that takes guts. And this is where things take a turn. The Court of Appeals, they completely overturned the RTC's decision. Whoa. A complete 180. 
you could say that again. The Court of Appeals sided with the employees. Okay, I did not see that coming. What was their reasoning? Why such a drastic change? Well, essentially, they said the RTC had no business sticking its nose into a labor dispute. Jurisdiction issues. Thanks, Heath. Right. Like you wouldn't take a speeding ticket to family court. Exactly. Different courts for different matters. The Court of Appeals basically put the RTC in its place, saying, hey, you're a civil court, not a labor court. This whole thing needs to be sorted out in the right place. So they shut down that whole public funds defense pretty quickly. Yeah, they weren't buying it. The Court of Appeals said Nico II's claims about being innocent purchasers and all that public fund stuff that needed a real trial with evidence and everything. They needed to back up their claims, not just talk a big game. Exactly. Seems like Nico II tried to take a shortcut and the Court of Appeals called them out on it. And sent them right back to square one. So what's next? Where do you go after the Court of Appeals? Well, in the Philippines, there's only one place higher to go. Uh-oh, this is getting serious. You're talking it's about... It's on the Supreme Court. Wow, they took it all the way to the top. That's right, the final word in Philippine law. I can't wait to hear what happened next. The Supreme Court, the big leagues. The highest court in the land. This is where the fight of our electric company showdown hangs in the balance. What did they have to say about this whole tangled mess? Well, get this. Okay. The Supreme Court decided to uphold the Court of Appeals decision. No way. Yeah, they shut down Nico II's petition completely. Wow, so it's over. The employees win. It's over, all right. What a wild ride. But it's the why that's really interesting. Okay, I'm listening. The Supreme Court basically said that Nico II made the wrong turn way back when. You mean with that whole petition for declaratory relief thing? Exactly. They said that was not the way to handle this situation at all. So what, they should have just, like, paid the employees back in 2013 and called it a day? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but you're getting the idea. Okay. The Supreme Court said Nico II should have explored other legal avenues, specifically within the labor case itself. Huh. Interesting. So they could have fought back, but in a different way. Precisely. There's this thing called a third-party claim. A third what now? Third-party claim. It lets you say, hey, that stuff you're trying to take, it's actually mine. Oh, like finders keepers, but legal. Kind of. But it has to be done in the right way, within the right case. Had Nico II done that, who knows what might have happened. Hindsight is twenty twenty, I guess. You could say that again. But wait, hold on a sec. What is it? What about that missing document? <laughs> you know, the deed of conditional sale? That was their whole argument, right? Ah, yes. The missing deed. This is where the case goes from legal battle to cautionary tale. Remember how Nico II kept saying they were innocent purchasers and bought everything fair and square? Yeah. Well, you'd think they would have, you know, shown the court the actual proof of purchase. Wait, are you saying? Throughout that whole legal circus, they never actually submitted a copy of the deed to the courts. You're kidding me. They staked their entire case on this document and they never even showed it to the judges. Not once. Mm. And the Supreme Court, they noticed. They even called Nico Sakellet out on it in their decision, saying that, Without the deed, they couldn't properly assess the agreement at all. Talk about an epic fail. To think that a multi-million dollar case could hinge on a single missing document. It just goes to show due diligence is no joke. It's not enough to be right. You got to prove it with bills on. So what's the takeaway here? What should we, the listeners, be taking from this electrifying legal saga? Well, for one, legal battles. They're a marathon, not a sprint. You need a solid strategy, a good lawyer, and all your ducks in a row. Check, chip. And two, never underestimate the power of details. A single document, even a tiny detail, can make or break your case. It's like they say, the devil is in the details. Exactly. This case is a masterclass in what not to do. So the next time you're about to sign something important, remember Nico Testic and that missing deed. Do your homework. Read the fine print. And for goodness sake, hold on to those important documents. Words to live by. This case has been a wild ride. Corporate intrigue, legal drama, a missing document. What more could you ask for? Thanks for joining us for another deep dive where we unpack complex legal cases and try to make sense of it all. It's been a pleasure as always. Until next time, stay curious and stay informed.
Booster Bar Exam Prep with 327 Landmark Cases, penned by Associate Justice Amy C. Lazaro Javier. Organized by Political Law, Labor Law, Taxation Law, and more, complete with quizzes and flashcards for easy review. Perfect for mastering key topics before the bar exam. See the description to purchase your copy today. Ever get one of those, whoa, that's a lot feelings when a friend tells you about something happening in their life? Oh, totally. Like you're suddenly grateful your life isn't a headline. Exactly. That's kind of how I felt hearing about a friend's international divorce. I mean, love knows no borders and all, but apparently neither does legal drama. That's more common than we think, right? Especially well, these days. Way more. Which brings us to this deep dive. We're looking at a case straight from the Philippine Supreme Court. Buckle up. It's Shulabakaltus Asilo versus, get this, presiding judge Maria Luisa Lezel G. Gonzalez Betik. Okay, someone really liked their vowels, but I'm guessing this is about more than just a mouthful of names. You got it. Think love, divorce, international laws, the whole shebang. Important stuff if you're thinking about a cross-cultural marriage. Okay, so set the scene for me. So we've got Sheila, Filipina, marries Tommy, American citizen, in Hong Kong. Sounds picture perfect so far, right? Like the start of a postcard, yeah. Hold on, plot twist. They divorce, and Sheila's the one who initiates it. No biggie in many places, but here's the kicker. The Philippines. No absolute divorce for Filipinos. Ah, okay, so that complicates things. Big time. Exactly. Which is why Sheila's case is a prime example of something that trips a lot of people up. How does a foreign divorce work when one spouse is Filipino and the Philippines wants nothing to do with divorce in the first place? Yeah, it feels like one of those legal riddles wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And you know we love unraveling those. <laughs> but before we get into the nitty gritty of Sheila's situation, what's the deal with the Philippine legal system and these international marriage cases? All right, so picture this. The Philippines, right? It's like this island legally speaking, in a sea of divorce laws. Seriously, one of the few places globally without full-on divorce for its citizens. So no quick see ya if you're Filipino and married. Annulment's the route there, but that's a whole other legal jungle. <laughs> but back to the case. The Philippines still cares about what went down in Hong Kong because Sheila's a citizen. Think of Article 26 uh, of their family code, like the safety net for Filipinos in these international marriages. Safety net? How so? It basically makes sure they're not penalized for something that was totally legal where it happened, you know, prevents messy situations if the foreign spouse is the one to pursue the divorce. So it's like the Philippines saying, we get it, international marriages exist, we're not trying to punish you for what happened elsewhere. Exactly. It's about fairness at the end of the day. Okay, that makes sense. So no easy divorces for Filipinos, but this Article 26-2 is there to even the playing field a bit. Yep. Got to protect their citizens. Right. So back to Sheila. She's gone through this divorce, wants to move on, but her home country is not exactly giving her the green light just yet. What happens next? Well, it gets twisty. Remember how I said it gets complicated? Her petition to make that Hong Kong divorce official back home dismissed. And not for the reason you'd think. Seriously, what could be so major that it throws off the whole thing? We're talking procedural details here, like forgetting a key step in a recipe. Okay, spill the tea. What you miss? Ultimate facts. Think of them as the crucial bits of info your whole argument hinges on. The make or break detail. Exactly. Yeah. And Sheila's petition. Missing one key ingredient. Tommy's nationality. Didn't state it outright. Case dismissed. Wait, really? It all comes down to that. Even though they were married, divorced, the whole nine yards. That's the thing about the law, right? Sometimes the smallest thing can derail everything. Wild. So proving Tommy was American, that was vital. But why? Because, and this is where it gets really interesting, Article 26 too, that safety net we talked about, it only kicks in if that foreign divorce is valid by the other spouse's national laws. Oh, I see. So it's not enough to say, hey, we divorced. The Philippines wants to make sure everything adds up on both sides of the equation. Exactly. Like, show your work, not just the answer. Makes sense. All right, so things are heating up for Sheila, and we're just getting started. More twists and turns to come in this case, so stick with us. So they want the receipts. Proof, not just promises. 100%. And that's where it gets really tricky, because you've got Philippine law, you've got American divorce law, and they don't always play nice together. It's like trying to translate between two totally different languages, except instead of words, it's legal jargon. And the stakes are high. We're talking about someone's life, their future, but wait, it gets even wilder. 
Remember how Sheila's trying to sort all this out? Oh, this is where Tommy makes a reappearance, right? He does. And he doesn't just reappear, he remarries. No way. Wait, so he's already moved on. Full speed ahead. And get this, he marries another Filipino woman right there in the Philippines. Hold on, hold on. So wouldn't that automatically make the divorce valid in the eyes of the Philippine government? I mean, he can't be married to two people at the same time, yeah, right? You'd think so, wouldn't you? But here's the thing. Philippine law, they like their evidence. They want the facts, the paperwork. Just because someone at the local registrar's office says, okay, you're good to go get hitched, doesn't mean the courts are bound by that. So it's like different parts of the government aren't on the same page. Exactly. And that's precisely why having a legal expert in your corner <laughs> is crucial. They can navigate those bureaucratic mazes, make sure everything's legit. Because the last thing you want is to think everything's fine and dandy, only to find out later that, legally speaking, you're in a really messy situation. It happens more than you'd think. And that's not even the half of it. This whole case, it really highlights why international family law is its own beast. Right, because you're not just dealing with different languages. You're dealing with totally different legal systems, different ways of doing things. And the stakes couldn't be higher. We're talking about someone's marital status, their ability to remarry, their rights here in the Philippines. Imagine trying to travel with your kids or claim an inheritance and hitting a wall because legally your home country doesn't recognize your divorce. Talk about a nightmare. Exactly. And it's something the Philippines takes seriously, especially with their stance on divorce. It's a tough balancing act, respecting foreign laws while still upholding their own. It's like trying to solve a really complex puzzle where the pieces keep changing shape. Love that. And thinking of puzzles, I think it's time we untangled this whole Article 26-2 business. Yes. Let's dive into the heart of the matter. What exactly does it say? And how does it apply to someone like Sheila? All right. So in a nutshell... Article 26.2 is like the bouncer at the club of foreign divorce recognition in the Philippines. Okay, so it decides who gets in and who stays out. Exactly. It basically says that if a Filipino citizen's foreign spouse gets a divorce that also allows them to remarry under their country's laws, then the Philippines will recognize those effects for the Filipino spouse too. So it prevents scenarios where, say, the Filipino is still considered married back home, but their ex is off living a whole new life elsewhere. Get the nail on the head. It's about fairness, you know? Preventing Filipinos from getting stuck in legal limbo because of what their ex did. Okay, so it makes sense. But there's always a but, isn't there? There is, and it's a big one. Burden proof. It's on the Filipino spouse to gather all the necessary documents, all the evidence, to prove the foreign divorce checks all the boxes. Which brings us back to Shella and that missing piece of the puzzle, right? Exactly. That's where it all went sideways. She needed to show, not just tell. The court wanted concrete proof that Tommy's divorce meant he could remarry under American law. And I'm guessing that information isn't exactly easy to find, especially when you're juggling two different legal systems. You're telling me. It can get crazy complicated, which is why having a good lawyer is essential. Someone who speaks both legal languages. Well, it's precisely. Someone who can bridge that gap, connect the dots. And I think that's what's so fascinating about cases like Sheila's they're not just about one person's divorce. They're about this larger conversation the Philippines is having. How do we balance our own values with this increasingly globalized world? It's like they're trying to figure out the rules of a game that's constantly changing. Perfectly said. And that's why we need to pay attention to these stories. They're like windows into how the law is evolving in real time. But for Sheila, the story isn't over yet. We left her at a crossroads, remember? Petition denied. What happens next? So it's not a game over for Sheila, more like a press start to try again? Pretty much. Yeah. The court left the door open for her to file again. Okay, so there's still a chance. But what does she need to change in round two? Remember those ultimate facts we talked about? The must-haves? She's got to make sure her next petition hits all the right notes. No missing ingredients this time. Exactly. Tommy's nationality, front and center and clear evidence that their divorce allows him to remarry under U.S. law. So it's not enough to just want it recognized. You gotta play by the Philippine legal system's rules too. 100%. And I think that's what's so interesting about all of this. The Philippine legal system, it's not stuck in the past. It's adapting, figuring out how to balance its own beliefs with, well, reality international marriages are happening. It's like they're trying to navigate a world that's changing faster than ever. Exactly. And cases like Sheila's. 
they're more than just personal stories. Mm -hmm. You know, they're shaping how the law evolves. Wow, that's a powerful thought. So it's not just Sheila's future on the line. It's about setting precedents for similar situations down the road. Exactly. These cases, they're like building blocks shaping the future of the law. And that's why we talk about them, why they matter beyond the headlines. Because they shine a light on those gray areas, the places where different legal worlds collide. Exactly. And honestly, that's what makes this whole area so fascinating. It's law, but it's also about people, about cultures, about navigating a world that's more connected than ever. It makes you realize how much we take for granted, assuming things will just work the same way everywhere. Right. Like, just because something's a given in one country doesn't mean it's going to fly in another. And that's especially true with something as important as marriage and divorce. It's like that saying, assume makes it, well, you know the rest. Exactly. So if there's one thing to take away from all of this, from Sheila's story and this whole deep dive, knowledge is power. Do your homework. Don't just assume. And <laughs> definitely talk to the experts. 100%. Because navigating international family law on your own, that's one legal adventure I wouldn't recommend. Not unless you're a lawyer yourself and love a challenge. But seriously, thanks for breaking it all down for us. This has been eye-opening. Anytime. These are important conversations to have. The more we understand about these complexities, the better equipped we are to navigate them. Absolutely. And for all of you listening, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll see you next time for another fascinating exploration of the law and how it shapes our lives. Prepare for your exams with 327 cases penned by Associate Justice Amy C. Lazaro Javier, organized by subject, political law, labor law, taxation law, and more. Includes quizzes and flashcards for effective study. Ready to elevate your review? Check the description now to purchase your copy and ace your exams. Inheriting property in another country? Now that sounds like something you'd only see in the movies, right? Like some treasure map, a long lost relative you never knew existed. Oh, you'd be surprised. I've seen those scenarios pop up more often than you'd think in international law. Right. It sounds almost too dramatic to be real. But speaking of drama, that's what we're diving into today. Little legal drama. I'm all ears. Today's deep dive takes us straight to the Supreme Court of the Philippines to untangle this case, a seemingly simple request about a will from overseas and a property right here in the Philippines. Ah, this is one of those cases that really highlights how messy things can get when different countries, different legal systems collide. You know, we often think of inheriting assets as like just a transfer of ownership, but there's a whole lot more going on under the surface. Absolutely. Let's set the scene for everyone. This case revolves around the estate of Lynetta, an American citizen living in Hawaii. Sadly, she passed away in 2017, leaving behind a husband and two daughters, one of whom is Allison, and a will. Okay, so far so good. Yeah. Right, pretty standard situation. And Lynetta's will was properly probated in Hawaii, which means a court there confirmed it's all above board according to their laws. Everything seems in order. What's the catch? Well, this is where things get a bit more interesting. Lynetta's estate included a piece of property okay in bardo cebu city philippines and it wasn't just any property oh. we're talking a prime parcel of land officially valued at php 896 million total hold on did you say 896 million that's not just some vacation home that's a serious piece of real estate you got it and that's where things get a little more complicated while the will itself was straightforward, the Philippines, like many countries, has its own specific process for recognizing and enforcing wills from overseas. Makes sense. Different countries, different rules. So how did this play out for Lynetta's daughter, Allison, who was tasked with settling her mother's estate? Right. So Allison wants to do things properly, files a petition in the Philippines to sort out the inheritance. But in, here's where we hit our first legal speed bump, both the Municipal Trial Court in cities, the MTCC, and the regional trial court, the RTC, yeah. they both dismissed her petition. Wait, they dismissed her case twice? What happened? Well, the MTCC took one look at the value of this land, all 896 million of it, and basically said, whoa, this is way too big for us to handle. This needs to go to a higher court. So they bumped it up to the RTC. Okay, a higher court makes sense. But then the RTC dismissed it too. What was their reasoning? Yeah, so even the RTC hesitated a bit. They stated that before they could proceed, certain legal steps needed to be taken care of, specifically related to recognizing that Hawaiian will. 
So it wasn't that they were saying the will was invalid, just that Allison hadn't quite jumped through all the legal hoops yet. Exactly. And let's be honest, dealing with this kind of back and forth, especially while you're grieving, that's tough. I can only imagine. It would be easy to just want to give up at that point. But it sounds like Allison was determined to see this through. Oh, absolutely. She was not giving up. In a pretty bold move, she decides to appeal directly to the Supreme Court of the Philippines, bypassing the Court of Appeals entirely, which is not common at all. This wasn't just about the property, it seems like. This was about principle. Wow. A true David versus Goliath scenario. So what was at the heart of Allison's argument to the Supreme Court? What did she say the lower courts got wrong? Allison argued that the lower courts had essentially misinterpreted Philippine law, specifically the rules of court that determine which court has the authority to hear certain types of cases. She firmly believed the RTC was the right place for her petition, that their interpretation of the jurisdictional rules was, well, flawed. Okay. And what was the Supreme Court's take on all of this? Did they agree with Allison? Were the lower courts in the right? And this is where it's really interesting. The Supreme Court, in a move that surprised many, took a deep dive into the very subtle but important differences between two key legal concepts, probate and reprobate. Probate versus reprobate, I'll admit those sound incredibly similar to me. Right. And that's where many people, even some legal folks, get tripped up. Probate is the process of saying, hey, this will is legit, which already happened in Hawaii, remember? Right. Reprobate is more about formally recognizing a will that's already been validated in a foreign country. Ah, okay. So it's less about the content of the will itself and more about where it was originally deemed valid. Precisely. And this distinction, this little bit of legal nuance, is where the Supreme Court really shook things up. Because all of a sudden, Allison's case wasn't just about a property dispute. It became about a much bigger legal principle. So the Supreme Court really honed in on this difference, this distinction between probate and reprobate. What did that actually mean for Allison's case, though? Did it help her? It did. The Supreme Court... As they were reviewing everything, they determined that even though there had been updates to Philippine law, clarifying which courts handle certain cases, those updates, they didn't erase the RTC's authority in reprobate cases. So even though parts of the law had been updated, the part about reprobate cases and the RTC, that was still valid. Okay, I think I'm starting to see where this is going. What was the final verdict? The Supreme Court sided with Allison. It was a victory for her. They overturned those lower court decisions and sent the case back to the RTC to start the reprobate process for Lynetta's will. Wow, what a journey, taking this all the way to the Supreme Court just to make sure her mom's will was recognized. It sounds like a pretty big deal. Did it set any kind of legal precedent? Oh, definitely. It really shines a light on how different countries, different legal systems, how they approach these wills, especially as our world gets more and more interconnected. In many places, the focus is on, is the will itself valid, like what happened in Hawaii? where the assets are, that comes later. So you're saying that once a will has gone through probate in one country, other countries should just automatically accept it? It's not quite that simple, unfortunately. Each country still has its own processes, its own safeguards in place, you know, to prevent fraud and make sure things are done properly according to their specific legal systems. Right, of course. But this case, it does seem to suggest that things could be a bit more, I don't know, streamlined. Exactly. And that's what makes the Supreme Court decision so important, so noteworthy. It shows a growing awareness, even among courts, that this needs to be smoother, this whole process of international inheritance. The Philippines, recognizing that Hawaiian probate, that made things so much easier for Allison. And it's definitely a step in the right direction. It makes you stop and think, imagine being Allison, you've lost your mother, and then you're dealing with this legal maze in a foreign country, no less. It would be so easy to give up, but she was determined. And her tenacity paid off, not just for her, but for anyone else who might find themselves in a similar situation. This case, it sets an important precedent, recognizing foreign probate like this. It really is a win-win. It really highlights how important it is to understand these legal nuances, especially as the world becomes more globalized. For our listeners, especially those who maybe have assets in different countries, what would you say is the biggest takeaway here? Plan ahead. I can't emphasize that enough. And seek expert legal advice. If you own assets in different countries, having a will that's valid in both your home country and where those assets are, it's crucial. Great advice. Speaking of expert help, looks like we're almost out of time for this deep dive. But before we wrap up, I want to go back to this probate versus reprobate idea. Seems like understanding that distinction, that's crucial in these kinds of international inheritance cases. 
Yeah, it's almost like that one key piece of information that unlocks a whole different process. Exactly. And for anyone listening, even just knowing these two processes exist, probate and reprobate, that could save so much time, money, heartache, all of it. Right. Sometimes that little bit of legal knowledge, even if you're not a lawyer, it's so important these days. It really is. And speaking of knowledge, you mentioned earlier that Allison's case, it might signal a shift in how these international inheritance cases are handled going forward. What did you mean? Well, this case, it really opens up this broader conversation about different legal systems. How can they work together more effectively, especially as more and more people are living and working and you know owning things in different countries? That's a good point. It makes you think, is it better for each country to have its own strict legal traditions, even if it creates roadblocks like it did for Allison? Or should there be a push for some kind of, I don't know, global legal standard for things like this? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. And there's no easy answer. It's a real balancing act. You've got to respect each country's laws. But then how do you make these cross-border situations, especially emotional ones like inheritance, how do you make those smoother? stuff. It really is. But at least in Allison's case, there was a positive outcome. Her persistence paid off. And that Supreme Court decision, that set a pretty big precedent. Absolutely. By really digging into the nitty gritty of probate and reprobate, and then choosing to say, hey, we recognize that Hawaiian probate, the Philippine Supreme Court, they made a big statement about our increasingly globalized world. For sure. And I think it's a great reminder that even with something like wills and estates, which seems pretty standard, things can get complicated quickly when you add international borders into the mix. Absolutely. The law is always evolving, always adapting. This case really highlights that. It certainly does. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive into this fascinating Supreme Court decision. We covered a lot of ground today. From the very personal story of a daughter fighting for her mother's legacy to a nuanced legal battle with implications that reach far beyond this one case. We really got into the weeds of international inheritance law. Explored that crucial difference between probate and reprobate. And even touched on the future of legal systems in a globalized world. And of course, we can't forget Allison, whose determination to navigate a foreign legal system may have just changed how these cases are handled in the future. She reminds us all that persistence, it really does pay off. It does. So listeners, next time you find yourself wondering about any of this, remember Lynetta's estate <laughs> and how this one woman's experience is shaping how we think about cross-border inheritance. A good reminder that a little knowledge, some planning, and never being afraid to ask why can make all the difference. Until next time, keep diving. Prepare for your exams with the ultimate guide, 327 cases penned by Associate Justice Amy C. Lazaro Javier. Covering political law, labor law, taxation, and more, plus quizzes and flashcards for a complete review experience. Don't miss out on the essential study tool for future lawyers. Check the description to purchase and secure your copy now. Ready for a deep dive into a tax case with uh, some pretty big consequences for businesses in the Philippines. We're going to be looking at Philippine VAT law today, specifically the case of Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus Deutsch Knowledge Services. Yeah, this case, it really gives us a good look at how VAT law works, especially when you're talking about zero rated sales and trying to get refunds. Right. And our main source for this deep dive is going to be the court document straight from the Supreme Court of the Philippines, where this whole thing ended up. So we've got Deutsche Knowledge Services, also known as DKS, a company from Singapore with a branch in the Philippines. They're registered to pay VAT and they mainly work as a regional operating headquarters, doing things like business planning, giving financial advice, all sorts of things. In this case, it shows just how important it is for companies, even those with what seem like simple operations, to really get a handle on all the details of these VAT rules. Because what happened was DKS filed to get a refund on what they said were unutilized input VAT amounts from back in the fourth quarter of 2009. And we're not talking about chump change here. This is over 34 million Philippine pesos. Yeah, that's a significant amount. And this is where the case really brings to light all the complexities of dealing with input VAT, particularly for businesses that have a mix of zero rated and VAT -able transactions. And just so everyone listening is on the same page, the Court of Tax Appeals, which we often shorten to CTA, is this special court in the Philippines and they handle, you guessed it, tax disputes. In this case, get this, it went from the CTA division all the way up to the CTA on bank. That means all the judges on the court had to hear it 
before finally landing in the lap of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. The fact that this case went through, like, the entire Philippine court system, it just shows you how important these legal issues really are. Okay, so let's back up a bit here. We need to make sure we all understand this whole zero-rated sales idea. So DKS, they're saying that some of the services they offer, especially the ones they do for companies outside the Philippines, should be considered zero-rated. So what exactly are we talking about when we say zero-rated sales in the Philippines, and why would a company really want their services to be seen this way? You've hit on a really important point there. In a nutshell, Zero-rated sales are transactions where the VAT is, well, 0%. But here's the catch. It doesn't mean the company itself doesn't have to deal with VA at all. They still got to pay VA on their inputs. Those are the goods and services they use in their business. However, because what they're selling, their output, is zero-rated, they can't charge VA to their customers. So they end up basically eating the cost of the VA they already paid. That doesn't sound very good for business. And that is exactly where the V8 refund comes in, because they've already paid V8 but haven't collected any from their customers. Businesses doing zero-rated sales can often apply to get that input V8 defunded. So it's kind of like the government is saying, we get it, you already paid V8, so we'll give you that money back since you couldn't charge your customers for it. Exactly. And that's what GKS was trying to do. They paid a good chunk of change in VAT on their inputs. And since they saw their services to these foreign companies as zero-rated, they wanted a refund. But, and I bet you can guess what's coming next, the tax authorities in the Philippines, the BIR, they took a really close look at DKS's claim. And that's where the real story begins. Sounds like this whole case comes down to two big questions. First, are the services that DKS provides actually zero-rated sales? And second, if they are, how much of that input VAT can they actually get refunded? You hit the nail on the head. And as we get into the arguments from both DKS and the BIR, you'll see how those simple sounding questions can get really complicated really fast. So we've got DKS claiming they should get a VAT refund on what they're calling zero rated sales. And we've got the BIR looking really closely at whether those sales actually count and how that refund should be calculated. So let's dig into the specifics here. What were the BIR's biggest issues with DKS trying to get this refund? Well, the BIR's main argument at the beginning had to do with DKS's documentation, or rather whether it was complete. They were saying that for a sale to be considered truly zero rated, a company needs to prove without a doubt that the customer receiving the service is actually outside the Philippines. And on top of that, they need to prove the service itself isn't some kind of exception to the zero rating rule. The BIR didn't think DKS's paperwork was strong enough in that sense. So it's not like they were saying DKS's services didn't count at all. It was more about proving that those services really fit the rules for being zero rated, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. Think of it like a trail of breadcrumbs. But instead of leading to Hansel and Gretel's gingerbread house, they lead to proof that a sale should be zero rated. The BIR wanted to see a clear connection every step of the way between the services DKS provided and why they qualified for zero rating. They were saying this detailed documentation is super important to keep the whole VAT refund system from being abused. And that makes sense. Like, it's a way to stop companies from saying their sales are zero rated when they're really not and trying to get money back they shouldn't. But what did DKS say about all this? Did they just admit they messed up their paperwork or did they push back? Oh, DKS pushed back for sure. They argued that they had submitted everything that was needed. This difference of opinion over what complete documentation really means became a huge point of disagreement in the case. But it's important to remember, this wasn't just about paperwork. What was decided here would directly affect how much money DKS got back and, even bigger, how VAT refunds are handled for everyone in the Philippines. And that's where the Court of Tax Appeals comes in, right? They're the ones who had to look at everything and figure out who was right according to the law. So what did they say? Well, the CTA division, that's the first level of the Court of Tax Appeals, they actually sided with the BIR. They agreed that DKS hadn't given enough proof to back up all their claims about zero-rated sales. So round one goes to the BIR. But I know this wasn't the end for DKS. Tell me more about how this case went up to the CTA on Bonk and then all the way to the Supreme Court. What were the big moments along the way? This is where it gets juicy. DKS was not happy with the CTA division's decision, so they appealed to the CTA on Bonk. Now, when a case goes on Bonk, it means all the justices on the Court of Tax Appeals get together to hear it and make a decision, not just a small group. This doesn't happen very often, and usually only for really complex cases or cases that could affect how taxes are managed in the Philippines in a big way. So basically, DKS was asking for a do-over with all the tax experts. Definitely a sign that things are heating up. So what happened? The CTA on bank kind of split the baby. 
They overturned part of the earlier decision, saying DKS was right about some things, but they still agreed with the BIR on other points, so DKS didn't get everything they wanted. A partial win for both sides then, but nothing really settled. No wonder it ended up at the Supreme Court. But before we go there, I think we need to talk about something the Supreme Court clarified that's really important. How businesses that have both zero-rated and VATable sales, like DKS, should handle their input VAT. What's the gist of that, and why is it such a big deal in this case? It's, you're spot on. This clarification from the Supreme Court is huge, especially for businesses like DKS that have to deal with this mix of VAT situations. What they said is, Companies in this position have two choices when it comes to input VAT. They can either use it to offset their output VAT first and then try to get a refund on whatever's left over, or they can go straight for a refund on the input VAT that's directly tied to their zero-rated sales. That sounds like a, a pretty big change in how input VAT is supposed to be used. Why is that such a big deal? What does it mean practically for businesses? So this is really a win for businesses in DKS's position, right? It's like they're finally being given the choice to decide what to do with this V8 instead of being forced into one specific way of doing things. Exactly. You've got it. That's why this clarification is so important. By saying there are these two options, the Supreme Court is acknowledging that businesses dealing with both zero-rated and viable transactions have a unique situation, and it gives them more flexibility, which could even mean more money in their pockets. I see what you mean. So instead of having to use input V8 to offset output VAT first, even if that means a smaller refund, DKS and businesses like them can now directly get back the input VAT they paid on those zero rated sales. That seems like a pretty big deal for managing cash flow and making sure you're not losing out on potential tax benefits. Huge. Think about a business that does a lot of exporting or international services. This ruling lets them get back the input VAT on those zero-rated sales much faster, and that can make a real difference in their financial planning and how much profit they make. It just goes to show how important it is to really understand these regulations and get good tax advice, right? Something that seems like a small technicality can actually have a big impact on a business's bottom line. But let's get back to DKS. Did this new way of looking at input VAT actually play a role in their case? Absolutely. That's exactly why DKS ended up with a bigger refund than the lower courts had initially given them. Wow. So even after all the back and forth, the scrutiny of their documentation and the appeals process, DKS actually ended up in a better position than when they started. That's right. And it shows why it's so important to fight these cases, even when you're dealing with a complicated legal system. This DKS case, it reminds us that tax law, sure, it can be tricky, but it also can offer up some unexpected opportunities if you know what you're doing and have the right people in your corner. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Persistence, good record keeping, and solid legal advice. Those are the big takeaways here. And don't forget about staying up to date on changes in tax rules. What might have been okay yesterday could change tomorrow, like we saw with this decision on input VAT. So for everyone listening who might be thinking, this is great for big companies like DKS, but I'm just a small business owner, mm. What does this case mean for them? These principles apply no matter how big your business is. Whether you're a small shop or a huge corporation, really understanding Philippine VAT law, especially the parts about zero-rated transactions, is crucial. This case proves that getting good advice can help you find ways to maximize your VAT refunds and come out ahead. Like we always say on this show, it's all in the details, and those details can make all the difference when it comes to taxes. Any last thoughts before we wrap up our deep dive into this fascinating case? I think this case should encourage businesses to be proactive. Don't be afraid to get help understanding how these laws affect your specific situation. You never know what you might find out. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up our look at the ins and outs of Philippine VAT law with the landmark case of Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus Deutsch Knowledge Services. Remember, knowledge is power, especially when it comes to taxes. Until next time, happy filing.